Bobbish. Um, yeah, I will talk about zero knowledge proofs and how you can use them for trust, privacy, and scalability. If you have any questions during the talk, just go ahead and ask them right away, because if there's something you don't understand, then you're probably not alone. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> right. um, I'll talk about, first of all, about zero knowledge proofs in blockchains and how they're useful there, because that's where I work and that's like where, where I know them and where we use them at Mina Foundation. <coughs> In case you're not interested in blockchain, please don't leave, because I'll also have a section about how to use them beyond blockchain and in everyday use cases that, that are quite relevant. Um, and in the first two talks, I'll just assume that they exist and that, that you can use them and that just cryptographers have, have done cryptographers have done a good job inventing them. And in the last section, I'll try to give you an idea for how they work, why they can work, not going into the specifics, like not giving you a lecture series, but giving you a bit of an intuition for how they can, how they can work. Right. So let's start with zero knowledge and blockchain. Um, what is a blockchain? It's a public open um, ledger where, you, um, where no one party is in control over the ledger, but the maintainership is shared between an open group of participants. So you start with some Genesis block that everybody agrees on, and then you have a protocol that, um, in every round, elects some entity to create the next block, collect the next transactions, and then um, add that block to the chain. And then you end up with a linear sequence of events, transactions, whatever. And um, because the system is open and decentralized, you might have temporary disagreements. So if somebody produces a block and they haven't seen the last one yet, then you can get some temporary fork is called, or if somebody doesn't, just doesn't play by the rules, then you can get temporary disagreements on what the correct state is. But the protocol is done in such a way that you have rules to pick one of those forks as the best one, and then you get eventual consistency between all the honest parties. Blockchains are designed to be decentralized, so have no one party in control of them to be censorship resistant so that if you want to send a transaction there, there's nobody that can stop you because, <clears throat> um, because of that shared property that like nobody has the, has the uh, power to censor any particular transaction. And they're also quite resilient because different people run different nodes and everything. Um, so they do that quite well. Um, but that comes at a cost. So, um, and that cost is privacy, efficiency, and scalability. If you have an open ledger where anybody should be able to just add transactions to the ledger, then by default they also need to know and can read every transaction. So by default you just have no privacy. In Bitcoin you have some like pseudonymity, but that's easily um, easily gone through. If, that's easily um, opened if you really want to. Um, they're also not really the most efficient system that you can imagine. So if you look at Bitcoin with a proof-of-work algorithm, it's actually hard to come up with any system that's less efficient. Um, <laughs> Proof-of-stake systems are, are more efficient, um, but so like if you, if you don't need the decentralization, then you're better off with just running a, a bunch of servers. And the thing where they're also quite bad is scalability. So in fact, they have negative scalability. And what do I mean when I, when I say that? Traditionally, if you have some kind of application that wants to serve a lot like, like some arbitrary number of users, then you have a number of servers that are, are running the, the application, and if you have demand from users, um, then you have some load balancer, and then you just distribute the load between all the different servers, and if you get more users and more load, you just add more servers to that. In a blockchain, however, every node in the system just replicates all the computations, and so if you add more computers, then you don't actually get more capability. It's just like, because there is no trust between the nodes, they need to replicate all the computations. And so adding another server just adds another server that does the same work as everybody else. And it adds additional overhead in terms of communication, so the, the capability of the system goes down if you increase its size. Um, right. So in particular, if you want to have add a new node to the system, then that node will need to um, get the chain from another node, and because it doesn't know, because it doesn't trust that node, it needs to validate the whole chain, meaning it needs to revalidate every transaction in the whole history of the system. And not only in the one correct history, but also in all those candidate forks that 
nodes might show it, and then it needs to decide which one is the is the right chain. And why does it have to do that? Why? Well, that is a matter of basically of trust, right? Because if you if you get some computational result, then either you have some reason to trust that it's correct. So, for instance, you have some application, some centralized setup where you run all the servers and they're all under your control, then a result coming from one server can be trusted by another one because they're all controlled by you, so there's no gain in like, not trusting that. But if you have an open system where anybody can participate, there will be dishonest participants, and so you cannot trust that they've done everything correctly, and so you need to check it. The question is, can we do anything else? Can we do anything better? If we can't trust them, do we actually need to check it, or can we do something else? And the answer is, we can do something else. We can use ZK SNARKs. And um, I should probably explain what they are. It's an acronym standing for Zero Knowledge, Succinct, Non-Interactive Argument of Knowledge. So let's unroll that from back. An argument of knowledge is basically a proof. It's a protocol between two parties, between a prover and a verifier. And the prover wants to convince the verifier that some statement is true. And um, there are different kinds of argument of knowledge protocols. And this SNARK is a particular flavor. It's like a characteris it's a characterization of a protocol, meaning that it needs to be non-interactive. So that means that um, you can do that just as a sequence of the prover getting some inputs and then creating that zero knowledge proof, handing it over to the verifier function together with all the inputs that are supposed to be public. And then the verifier can just decide whether the prover is indeed um, correct or whether they lied without any back and forth. And that's very, um, that's very useful if you want to use that in some automated <coughs> protocol. Succinctness means that the size of the proof and also the computational complexity of verifying the proof does not grow linearly with the thing that you want to prove. So it only grows logarithmically. So for practical purposes, you can view it as constant. And that, can, that, that concerns only like the proof once it has been constructed and the, the amount of work that you have to put in in order to verify it. Like constructing the proof that will still depend on the size of whatever it is that you want to prove. But after you've produced the proof, the proof size and the complexity of verifying it, that is, that is constant. And then zero knowledge, lastly, says that in that protocol between the prover and the verifier, the verifier does not gain any information besides that statement that the prover claimed is true is actually true, so nothing else. And that's quite cool. So for now, let's, exu let's assume that these things exist, and let's see what we can do with them. In the last part of the presentation, I'm going to give you some, some more insight into what they, what they are, how they look at. So, with these ZK snarks, we have a third alternative, right? We don't need to trust the other nodes. We don't need to check the result. We can just demand that they give us a proof and then verify the proof. And that proof, because of the succinctness, um, can be verified much quicker than like redoing the whole computation. And that is what we use in the, in the protocol that we use at Mina, which is called Ouroboros Masika. It's a variant of the Ouroboros family, which, is, um, which has been invented for Cardano. And the way that it works is that, again, you start with a Genesis block, but when the first block producer produces their block, they um, produce a snark, so a proof of knowledge that that block is actually a valid extension of the Genesis block, meaning that there exist like, uh, correctly signed and valid transactions that go from the Genesis block to, the, to, that, to that block number one. When the second block producer comes along, they get that, um, that proof of knowledge and they get the first block and they create the second block and they also create a proof that the second block is a valid extension of the first block. Now, so far, that, that doesn't really give you anything, but the nice thing about these snarks is that um, you can express like any kind, a, a proof for any kind of computation in there and verifying a snark in itself is a computation. So that way you can recursively include that first snark into another, or you can include those two snarks into one snark that tells you, okay, that second block is a valid extension of the, of the Genesis block. And, oh, what happened there? 
Um, and then you have like one snark that tells you basically, okay, that current state of the chain is a valid extension of the chain again. And then you can iterate that. Yeah? Yeah, so if so you're actually only given the below proof, right? That two is an extension of the general risk block. Right, yeah. So you, you need to in order to create that, like you need to the, the work that you need to do is you need to like prove that the second is an extension of the first one. And then you can combine that with the first one, and then you send that that resulting snark that like the second block is a valid extension of the genus block to the next block producer. Okay, so somehow in this proof it actually includes yeah. all the previous steps because yeah. otherwise I could just like right. yeah yeah this is an extension of the genesis block because it's like a direct descendant or something. Right. Yeah. You 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 have that you have that transitively you prove that every block is a valid extension of the chain. And you can basically create that proof for the current block in constant time because of that recursivity. Because you don't need to, if you had to like prove the whole history manually, then at some point the time for creating the proof would, would like be too long. But because you can recursively include the other snark into the, into the next one, you can, yeah, get that, yeah. Could I write you another state one with a valid proof? And then extend that to two, and it would be indistinguishable. Say again. So I have state one. Yeah. I do a different state one, which is also valid, but not the same one. Yeah. And then from there, it's, it would create number two, and it would be indistinguishable. Um. Yeah. Yeah. But that wouldn't really hurt. The final state is the same one. It would also be okay. kind of artificial because, like, if the final state is the same, then that means that also like the transaction history is the same. So the final state means that that basically includes that it includes a series of transactions. Yeah, but it could be different the transactions. Like I didn't send you. But then you wouldn't end up at the same with the same with the same block. You would get two prime. Yeah. What you would get a you get a prime. you would get a different second block, and you you can get that. So you can you can have like you can have two blocks for the same slot that are both valid. But then um, the protocol ensures by, the, by um, basically having a rule for having a tie break between competing chains that honest parties will at some point agree on one state. Okay. So you still have that issue yeah. of deciding when, yeah, when, yeah. when there's but a fork. Yeah, when there's a fork, then like, the protocol is designed in a way that at, after some time it is resolved. But yeah, you can have them temporarily. Yeah. And then with that recursive structure, um, you can transitively prove that any block that you present to your peers is actually an extension of the genesis block. More questions? Yeah, cool. So then the, the verifier mm -hmm. needs basically the genesis block, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. snark 5 block, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Right. And maybe the block 5 uh, itself. But block yeah. Number, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the so genesis the, block, the block mm -hmm. number 5, and the snark for the yeah. block number 5. Right, yeah. That's the nice thing about these zero knowledge proofs that you don't need to give like you don't need to give all the input that go into the proof. So that's that's the that's the magic part of it. <laughs> yeah. So it's always the last one yeah. you have the before. Don't have the original or the last one. What's the input for the verifier? Would that be flip, flip back to the well. Uh, what's the input for the verifier? So you have it on the first or second yeah, slide. Right. Could you please flip back one more? Yeah. Would it just be the number? This is block number one, seventeen, one, one, and it descends from the original block, and that's it. Which, which this one? This one. Yeah, yeah. This is the, the okay. input for the verifier. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe this is going a bit too. Maybe, maybe we do that after. The, yeah. So perhaps. Uh, yeah. Can this be used to bootstrap a Bitcoin blockchain, for example, so that I have zero knowledge proof that, like, block number? The protocol needs to be compatible with it. So, like, the you need to have a the, the algorithm that that decides whether the block is valid. It needs to be compatible with that mechanism of creating a snark for it. So it's not trivial to design a a blockchain algorithm that is compatible with presenting a snark for the block. Now the mouth, please. 
Hmm? I'll be like, now do mathematics, please. Like, at, at the end, yeah, <laughs> at, the, at the end. <laughs> a little bit of math at the end, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so far, any, any more questions besides the ones that go really deep? <laughs> okay. Actually, um, I understand that zero knowledge nodes don't um, reveal any information mm -hmm. to, the, from the, to the verifier about yeah. the pretty state. Um, from what I get, well, this is nice uh, for a lot of things, <laughs> yeah. but. Um, well, this does not seem to be any actually necessary. Yeah, for that we don't need it. So it's for that, the zero knowledge property is not something actually, that we need right? right? So we, any SMARC would work with that. Okay. We don't need the zero knowledge property okay. yet. Right, great, great question. Thanks. Okay. Well, we do need it. Yes, and that's a great segue. Thanks. <laughs> so people also want to run programs on blockchain. So that's what's called smart contracts. So the way that it works is you write some script and it takes some inputs, creates some outputs, and then Traditionally, you just submit the script and the inputs to the blockchain, and then every node does the calculation and modifies the ledger state according to whatever the output of the script is. That's, again, not ideal for two reasons. One is the obvious efficiency thing, but also you might not want to give away all your inputs that go into the script. So if you have, say, you have a transaction that allows you to do gambling or buy alcohol or something, where you need to be, like, 18 or older or need to live in a certain country, you don't want everybody to see your ID or something. So that's, that's like one of, the, one of the things that you might not want to give away, but you need to give it as an input to your script. Um, and so here you again have a computational result that you, don't, you can't trust, and you would need to check it, and for that you would need the inputs. But again, if you can demand a proof instead, and the proof doesn't contain the inputs, then you can do better. You can write your script in a way that it takes the inputs and then it creates the outputs and along with the outputs it creates a SNARK that proves that those outputs are a valid result of that script for some inputs that exist. And then you can just do the computation locally on your own machine and submit just the outputs and the SNARK to the system and the system will act accordingly. And this is uh, quite interesting because um, it allows you to have some degree of privacy and it's also a way of basically outsourcing computation to a very powerful computer, which is your laptop. It's a, it's a fast computer compared to a blockchain, which is like a very slow computer. And so by creating that, um, that snark, you can, you can use your local machine or host server or whatever to um, produce the result and then submit the result to the blockchain. The blockchain doesn't have to recompute everything. It also allows you to basically introduce any degree of privacy that you want into applications that run on the chain. So you have a control over that. Because privacy, it's not, it's not a binary thing where you either have zero or one. It's more of like a spectrum, where you have things like Bitcoin, which are not very private at all, because everybody can see every transaction, and then at some point they can also figure out who you are. Banks are a bit more private. You still need to share all your transactions with somebody, but that somebody is a party that you trust or have to trust or whatever, and then depending on where the bank is, you might have like <laughs> larger degrees of, of privacy or, or, or less privacy. Cash is pretty private as, as you go, and then there's also, there's also cryptocurrencies where you have total privacy, where every, where every transaction is private. Those are then problematic again for other reasons, because they're very easy to abuse for nefarious reasons, like money laundering or terrorism financing or something like that. And so it's really hard to, to use them depending on the, um, on the region where you live that might be, might be illegal. But with these zero-knowledge applications, you can, you can pick wherever you want your, your application to live. And, sorry, ah, did, <laughs> did you get it? Almost, <laughs> almost. The slides will also go on. Yep, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. And with that, the, one example is uh, a cash-like payment system that a company called Etonic has um, built for Mina. Um, and the way that that works is it's trying to mimic cash in the way that you can do like ordinary everyday transactions in a completely private manner. And then if you are dealing with like real money or you're doing lots of transactions, then you have to give more transparency. And um, so you have like a, a limit for, for a single transaction that you, if you are below that limit, then you can just do it in a private manner. 
uh, provided that also like the person that you're uh, no, no, provided that also your monthly turnover doesn't exceed a certain limit. And then when you want to do a private transaction, you basically submit along with the like the, the statement that you want to transfer money, you submit the proof that you have undergone a KYC process, the transaction is below that, that limit, and your monthly turnover is also below that limit. And then the recipient also have to prove that their turnover is below a certain limit. And then if all of these um, proofs validate, then you can do a private transaction, and if not, then you have to go to a, to a more transparent way of doing, doing the transaction. Right? And then the system has to validate those proofs, but they don't have to see anything about, about the, the transaction itself. So they don't have to know who you are, they don't have to know what the actual amount is. It's just like, okay, this is a valid transaction from somebody who has undergone KYC, and it's like below those, below, below those limits. And um, yeah, so this concludes the first part of the, of the presentation, um, where I've shown you how at MENA we use these zero-knowledge proofs in order to keep the good parts of the blockchain, but um, improve on the, like, on the traditional weakness of blockchain systems. We have programmable privacy, you have something that's more efficient because you don't need to replicate all those things, and you also get some Scalability. You also can get more scalability by something that I haven't talked about, which is called a roll-up, where you basically um, allow participants to um, pack transactions, pack multiple transactions into one, and then only submit the proof that this is like the result of all those transactions. That's how you can get scalability. Real scalability. Um, right, so let's uh, talk a bit about zero-knowledge applications beyond blockchains. <coughs> And the example that I'm choosing is something that should be of interest to, to basically everybody. It's uh, disinformation in social media or, or any kind of media, actually. <coughs> so um, you might remember that uh, when the pandemic hit and there were like uh, restrictions and everything, that uh, some people just um, took that as something that was necessary to fight the pandemic. Other people decided to demonstrate against it. And then somebody posted a picture on Facebook claiming that 4 million people were demonstrating in Berlin. And People in Berlin were a bit surprised about that. And um, in fact, the, the DPA fact-checking site, there, there's a site from the DPA that does fact-checking. And they said that this picture is from the Love Parade for 20, 21 years ago. And so this picture is so old that my parents didn't allow me to go there because I was too young. And now I don't have any hair left. <laughs> so um, this is like a good example for pictures that have been produced but just have been taken out of context to claim something that, that isn't actually true. There's also the diff different examples. So we recently had, or are, we are having protests in Germany against far-right parties, and then they claim that these pictures were manipulated because you can't see the Ulster here. But then again, DPA fact-checking confirmed that this is like a legitimate picture. Um, so you can fight these kind of disinformation attempts by doing manual fact-checking, but that's not ideal because it's like an, an arms race. It's really easy to post something that is fake, but it takes a lot of effort to 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 to, to like refute it. And also, um, in the end, you need to trust the people who are doing the fact checking. So it's it's a it's a problem. And um, uh, there is a nice paper by Trisha Data and Dan Monet about uh, zero knowledge proofs, how you can use them to to basically automate this this fact checking process. Um, it builds upon, yeah, again, it's, it's that, that question of trust, right? This time it's not about a computation, but it's about pictures on media or social media. And you have the, like, the decision whether you want to fact check it, and then that's something that doesn't scale well, and you have to trust somebody else. You can also just use your own judgment, but then you might be biased, so that's also not ideal. But with your knowledge proofs, you can demand a proof that this picture is indeed something that has been taken at that place in time. The way that it works is that um, the first component is actually something that um, like camera manufacturers have to do. And that's something that they're already doing. So you can embed a secret signing key into the hardware of a camera in a way that ideally is hard to extract. And then the camera also has a GPS chip and, and a clock. And so it can know where it is and when it is. And then whenever you take a picture, it can produce a signature that that picture has been taken by that camera at this point in space and time. 
that's great, but it doesn't solve the problem completely because you will not publish the original picture because the original picture is too large, like just the data size is something that you don't want to put on, on social media. And also you might want to process it. You might want to like change the contrast. You might want to blur people's faces if they shouldn't be recognizable. So you want to do some manipulations, but not arbitrary manipulations. Because arbitrary manipulations, then you could create any kind of image. But if you do some modification to the original data, then the signature check will fail. Um, so how do you solve that? Well, the answer is you can create a zero-knowledge proof that there exists some original image that has been signed by the camera, and then there exists also a series of permissible innocuous manipulations that have been applied to that picture and that result in a given picture. And then uh, you can just publish that picture along with the proof, and that way you, you can have like a, like a plugin in the browser that could check that, okay, this proof is actually correct. So this picture that I'm showing you now is a picture that is the result of a picture that has been taken at a certain point in space-time and then has been manipulated by a series of like resizing, cropping, whatever. Um, and that's, that's quite a nice thing because it, it is one step in basically evening out that arms race between this information and information. Yeah? Will an artificial intelligence engine put in every phone also be a permissible No, edit? no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the thing. You, you, Creating fake images is so easy. You can either, you can use a use an artificial intelligence. You can just browse the internet for something that, that has occurred in a different place. Um, but yeah, it's not permissible to just like take an AI and <laughs> and create an image. Yeah, another question. I've heard this solution in contrast of this whole uh, discussion very often recently, mm -hmm. and uh, this technical solution sounds very nice, but what can we do about Right. It's not a panacea. It's not a panacea, but it is one step in making, in, in evening out this discrepancy of, being, of it being very easy to post something that's fake and very hard to prove that it's actually fake. Yeah. yeah. I really don't understand how we can actually do signature on the, com on the camera. Like, I can try to, I can basically spoof the GPS mm -hmm. on, on the camera. So, the, basically, the the camera would have to have a secure enclave that would mm -hmm. contain the GPS sensor yeah. that would be that would have to be I don't know, I mean it's securely with the set of yeah. things, which also is not always a plus have a atomic clock that continuously <laughs> runs without battery until the end of time, and also be not like and like with uh, I've I've opened so many security yeah. enclaves yeah, yeah. I can read out <laughs> any key like so yeah I don't know the details, I know there is a standard for this, okay. and they probably have thought about these things. So I could imagine that like, if the battery has not been, if, if like, the clock hasn't been running continuously, then the camera would refuse to do a signature just, or, or like, if it hasn't had contact to a trusted time server, or, or whatever. Doesn't so that's, GPS provide time at least? Oh, yeah, yeah but right. Can, but GPS is like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. fake GPS. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But again, that is something that is like much more difficult to do than just taking a picture and saying it's like. Yeah. But you can do it in Mars. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, this technology or this invention could it be used for uh, online voting systems? Uh, you, you mean zero knowledge proofs in general? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, like yeah, uh, yeah. How would it work? Like uh, some public person claims publicly that uh, well, I'm the Genesis guy and I vote this way. And then, uh, so you would, you would have <laughs> like some. You would need to have some registration. So like if you, if you yeah. want, yeah. And, and then you could prove that okay, I I have a valid password, I, a passport. I am eligible for the vote. I have not voted yet. And then this is my vote. And then the system could record that. And then it could like aggregate all the votes without tracing any of the votes back to it. Which will, and then the last yeah. guy who was voting who mm -hmm. really. Through the envelope, uh, can yeah. say yeah or no. Yeah, then you then you need to like you need to evaluate like the, the result of. Is it already implemented something like that? There are projects that, I, I, I yeah, there are the, the projects that, that do like. Yeah. 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 Ye
I'm not pretty sure. I mean, I, I don't know of any like yeah. actual uh, votings in yeah. countries mm -hmm. or states, yeah. but I know there's uh, India has this Bellinius yeah. mm -hmm. project, which is used for some online yeah. groups to. Uh, yeah. Can you repeat the name, please? Yeah. Bellinius. B B B B L B N I O S. Let's yeah. spend a couple of yeah. minutes now on how these zero knowledge proofs actually work. So um, I'm not going to explain to you how a ZK snark works because that is much too complicated. I will give you an example of an interactive protocol of a zero knowledge proof, and then I will mention what kind of mathematics goes into ZK snarks, and um, then yeah, that, that's all I can I can do in this presentation. So the use case for this is um, I am working at my home office, and my kids want to be entertained, so I tell them to solve a Sudoku, but they come back and say it's not solvable. I can't do it. So I need to prove to them that it is <laughs> possible to solve it. But I cannot give them the solution, because then they would be bored again. So what do I do? I can do the solution for that, right? I'm capable of doing that. And then I do a little trick. I permute all the numbers in the solution. And then I cover everything up by a sheet of paper. And then I tell my kid, OK, this is a valid solution of a Sudoku, and it has been derived from this Sudoku by a certain permutation, and now you can challenge me. Because I claim that this is correct, and you can challenge me. You can challenge me by asking me to reveal a single row or column of the Sudoku, and then you can check that all the numbers occur there. You can challenge me by picking a certain square, or you can challenge me, because those two things only to show you that I have a solution to one Sudoku, you can also challenge me to show, me, to show you the original numbers permuted with a permutation along with a permutation. So then you get a connection to the original Sudoku. And I, I allow them to do any one of the, these things. And after they've done that, they have some reason to believe that I might be right. right? And then what I do is I throw away the solution. I do the same thing again with another permutation. And I repeat the process. And that way, with every time that they don't catch me at cheating, they get more confidence that I'm actually not lying, that I, that I do know the solution. And, um, but they don't get any information about the actual solution, because it's all permuted. And I'm only revealing the permutation in the cases where I only reveal those initial numbers. And in every other case, they only get information that, yes, this is a solution to a Sudoku. So this is like a, it's an interactive zero knowledge proof that, that, that you can do with your kids. Of course, like, while we're doing that thing, I'm also not working, so it's not, not ideal. But that, that's why we want succinct and non-interactive uh, systems. Right. Um, right. So it's more of a probabilistic proof? In a yes, way. always. Yes, of course. So, so all these these models, it's all probabilistic, but with high, very high probability. Like, basically, yeah, and and every, yeah, but most, most, most things are. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so that's not a ZK snark yet because it's like it's not non-interactive, it's not succinct. It is zero knowledge and it is an argument of knowledge. If you want to go from here to a ZK snark, then you have to use a lot of mathematics. You have to use polynomials of a finite field. That is basically something that allows you to forego that step of challenging again and again. Because uh, and, and the property of polynomials that you use there is that if you have a polynomial of finite degree over a large field, and it's zero at one point, you can show that, then with a very high probability, it's zero everywhere, because it only has a finite number of zeros, and the field is large. We also need to use elliptic curve cryptography. Commitment schemes are basically a cryptographic replacement for that piece of paper with which you cover stuff that allow you to write something down, but like only give enough data that allows people to challenge you later on without any information about it. And then you need to express your whole calculation in an arithmetic circuit, kind of like doing your own hardware. Um, and that allows you to make a connection, basically, between the original uh, computation and those polynomials. Um, that's not very convenient, and you wouldn't want to do that by hand. And so in MENA, we have that um, a DSL, domain-specific language, for creating programs that come along with, with the proof that they're correct. And with that, you can basically write your program in ordinary TypeScript. You need to use like special um, types that are compatible with being represented by finite field elements, um, and you need to have some. You need to obey some constraints. You need to be a bit careful with control flow because 
the circuit size needs to be determined statically. So you um, you need to use like um, custom custom if statements. Yeah, cool. Um, right, um, and I can show you like a bit how how a program using that library or one JS works. Um, this is like the Sudoku example. So you can create your own like more structured uh, types using um, a handful of types that are already defined by the library, like a field element or also some bools. And internally, they're all represented by elements of a finite field, and then they're also packed nicely. And so, like you can you can have um, you can have arrays of those to represent that that field of, of Sudokus. And then um, actual smart contracts on the on the chain are represented by extensions of that smart contract class. They can have some limited amount of state that lives on the chain, and that state needs to be like um, of a provable type. So like either those types defined in the library or stuff that builds upon that using that uh, struct extension. And then these can be stored on the chain, and you can you can um, retrieve. Those um, yeah, and you can you can set them, and you can re retrieve the values, and you can have those functions assert equals. Those are basically uh, functions that take two values and compare them, and then deliver proof that they are equal. So in the Sudoku example, uh, you would call a method of that smart contract. A method is like a function of the smart contract that um, delivers, along with the result, the proof that it's been done correctly. And then you would give that um, that method, like the um, Sudoku instance, uh, like the the original numbers, and then also your solution. And then it would verify that, like, um, yeah, all all the numbers occur everywhere, and it would also verify that, like, these two agree on all the necessary um, points. And then it would check that the um, the instance, so like the the seed that you have given, that that is the same that has been set um, in the state by comparing hashes, and then if all of that is, is right, then it would um, yeah it, it would set the solved state to true. That's how you write uh, smart contracts for that. So like you you don't need to think about these finite fields if you write that, but it's still it's all translated to finite fields, and you have to like um, use for instance these these custom um, or statements instead of just um, using ordinary um, ifs. Um, right, and that's the conclusion of my presentation. If you want to know more about that whole area, we have like a, a knowledge section on our documentations page where you can have links to like different um, videos and, and lectures and blog posts and whatever. And also, if you're really interested in that area, then we're also hiring at the moment for in the engineering and product. Thanks. Any questions? How much slower is running something as a, like an application? Um, yeah. So this is like the good. the nice thing is that so so creating the proof does take time, um, but the nice thing is you can do that on your own machine, and your own machine is much more powerful than blockchain, um, and it depends a bit on um, like so. Okay. So there is the um, the library that is used in the node itself for the protocol, and then there is also the library that you use from the from the smart contract side, which is basically something that's that's um, translated to WebAssembly, I think, and that one is less performed than the one on the on the protocol side. So, like the creating the proofs in the protocol is somewhat um, somewhat fast. Creating them for for your own smart contracts is fairly slow at the moment, so like multiple seconds. But I mean, like in the panel of blockchain, let's yeah. say I, yeah. I, I have a, you know, ah, it scales yeah. on a, an image yeah. and it takes two yeah. seconds on, ah, my, yeah. on my laptop. Is it like, like two minutes or two hours or two right. days? So um, in, that, in that work by uh, Data and Bonnet, I think they said that they can do 13 megabyte images in under a second, like creating the proof. I think that was, that's what I okay. remember, but I, yeah. So it's not absurd. Not absurd, yeah. And the nice thing is like, that's something you do once, 
and then the verifying that is something that's fast. So you want to you want to not reveal the source code, but only the compiled, and then you want to prove no, some. No, no, I, no. I want to I want to delegate some untrusted worker to build my thing, and I want ah. to make sure that whatever it ah. me back is actually compiled from that source. Yeah, that's that that should be possible. I mean, you you would need to have a compiler that that creates the proof along with the with the program. So I I'm not sure that these exist, but it's something that you can that that is. To, to Perhaps the same question as before, is it practical at, at the moment? So for example, if uh, if I have an expression in the lambda, or if I have an expression in the lambda calculus or a proof in a theorem prover mm -hmm. and I want to convince you that a certain statement is true, I, I believe I have a proof expression and I want to give you a zero knowledge proof that I have actually proved it without revealing the expression. Is it something that is practical at the moment? At least my impression on the uh, on these polynomials and finite fields where that, that they're kind of different from like a general lambda calculus. So it's not clear how to map one to the other and there might be some severe performance penalty. Yeah, I mean it is, I mean it you can map any kind of computation on on these snarkable um, yeah, on, on the on these arithmetic circuits. Yes. The question is like, yeah, what's what's the performance overhead and what is the, the price that you're willing to pay for that? But yeah, in principle it's, it's doable. Yeah, is there some, some some known example for this performance penalty? I I mean my impression mm -hmm. was that trying to map an arbitrary lambda expression might be extremely expensive. Yeah, so, so the nice thing is that because they are so hot in blockchain right now, there's a lot of innovation on making these things more performant and more usable. And then the, the other areas where, they, where they're also, where they're like not, not, that, not that popular right now, they also benefit from, from that. And so I, I guess like, yeah, mapping lambda calculus to that, why not? There is a number of YouTube videos uh, from math, math popularization mm -hmm. channels uh, dedicated to zero knowledge yeah. proof, from computer file, number yeah. file, up and atom, etc. Can you recommend one of them, or can you tell us something about them? Do we go deep enough, or are we too shallow? Or so there is like there is a lot of um, like material on the on on that on on that level of the of the Sudoku thing. Uh -huh. what, 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 yeah. Um, and that is that is good for building an intuition. Uh, um, like if you want to understand the maths, then there are like there are, as, yeah, th there are basically lecture series and, and blog posts. Um, you can you can follow that that link from from our webpage. There are there there's also links to yeah, like more advanced advanced stuff. Yeah. Thank you. All the way in the back. Yeah. So you you mentioned that your the TypeScript library. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, um, l like the the thing about mapping mapping your stuff to these arithmetic circuits and creating the snark, the, the circuit size needs to be determined up front. So, if you have arbitrary branching and stuff, then then you can't do that. But um, there are like basically the, the, the library defines custom if statements where like both branches are always um, like. Calculated, but then discarded. One last question. I like the Sudoku example, but then uh, the first example you showed, uh, uh, you you showed the row after the mm -hmm. replacement, and yeah. it's not proving anything because uh, <laughs> the, the row itself isn't proving it's anything, right? And that's the point. <laughs> that's, that's the point. It's only proving something when you iterate that many, many times. So you iterate it many times, and every time you change the permutation. You have the one is red, 
Say again? In this room, there is just one red digit, and that's the one. Yeah, right. So uh, <laughs> if you do it a thousand times, it, it will show a thousand but, times nothing. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Like every time my kid can choose to, to get a different row or something. Ah, and so, what? so it can choose like any row, any column, any square, or the permutation along with the initial numbers. And then every time they don't catch me at cheating, they get more and more convinced that I'm actually right. Okay. And then yeah. it's active and that's not what you're yes. trying to show yes. us, but uh, yeah. you're trying to... Yeah. Okay. okay. Very good question. Thanks. Yeah.